If you have your Bibles, please do turn to that portion of Scripture which was read, Galatians chapter 5. I know that we have been working through Isaiah, through the servant songs, and we were to be looking at the final one, but I just felt that it's such a great passage and I didn't really have time this week to give it justice. So I felt we'll preach on this, which is another great passage, and I still won't do it justice, but I thought it'd be good to give more preparation to Isaiah 53. So we will look at that perhaps next time I'm, I'm up here, God willing. But we're going to be looking this evening at Galatians 5. So if you'd like to turn there, just before we do, let, 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 let's just pray and ask for God's help. Father, we thank you that you are glorious and that you are a God who speaks. We thank you that you are not silent and that you don't leave us to try and figure things out for ourselves, but that you are a God who speaks through creation, you speak to us through your word, and most importantly, you've spoken to us through Christ. Father, we thank you that we have your word before us this evening, that you have given us a special revelation, things we could never work out for ourselves. And Father, we pray that as we look at your word now, that you would give us understanding. Father, that you help me, think of the words of, of Richard Baxter, that you will help me to preach as never sure to preach again and as a dying man to dying men. And Father, for those of us who listen, help us to listen as though our lives depended on it. For Lord, the truths contained in your word are, are that important. Father, give us help and grace, we pray. We ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're looking at this passage this evening, which is, uh, I, I'm sure, familiar to most of us. But I find for myself that the truth that's in this passage is something I need to be reminded of every day. Every moment I need to be reminded of what's in this passage. And so I thought it would be good to repeat it. I, I, I think Andy's preached through Galatians uh, in the past, so, so this will be familiar material. But I think it's something we need to be reminded of again and again and again. So I thought it would be good to preach in it this evening. Now the major theme of this letter that was written to the church in Galatia by the Apostle Paul, the, the major theme is one of legalism. The, the problem that the church was facing was that there was this group who sometimes referred to as Judaizers who, who had come into the church, Jewish believers perhaps, and they were teaching the Gentile Christians that they had to be circumcised, that they had to follow the Old Testament law in order to be Christians. They had to follow Moses as well as follow Christ. And so the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to combat that error and to tell them, to teach them the truth that we're saved by faith, not by the works of the law. Salvation is by grace alone and not by works. And so Paul is, is writing that le this letter to, to sound that truth. And it's a theme that, that, that reoccurs throughout the letter, not by works of the law, not by circumcision, but through faith alone in Christ alone. And so that, that is a major theme. But another danger that they had, one danger was, was legalism. Another danger that they had was, is on the, the opposite side of the spectrum, and that was license. Whenever you preach a gospel of grace, you're going to have some people who say, well, that's just great. That means I can live how I like. That means I can sin all the more because grace, if grace abounds, well, let's let sin abound. And so in this part of the letter, the Apostle Paul is combating that error. You've got the one danger of legalism, and then you've got the opposite danger of license. And the Apostle Paul is trying to, to keep them in the middle um, with biblical truth. And so he spends a lot of time addressing legalism, and now he turns his attention to license, to those who think that now I've got a ticket, a free pass, to live how I like. Now, this is a, a challenge, not just for the Galatian Christians, but for Christians in any generation. How can I avoid legalism on one side and license on the other? How can I live a holy life and not be legalistic and at the same time not live without law, not, not, not live in lawlessness, not live in sin? How can I maintain the balance? Well, that's the topic the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of God's Spirit, addresses in these verses, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through to verse 26. 
He's, he's telling you how, as a Christian, you can avoid these two errors. And it's important for our walk with God. It's important for our Christian lives. But it's also important, not just for us as individuals, but as a church, that we get this right. If you look at verse 15 of chapter 5, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Speaking about license, living in in, in lawlessness, he says in verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you can be consumed by one another. So the problem in the Galatian church was that their liberty, their freedom which they had in Christ, they were using that freedom, that liberty, as license, and it was causing division. It was causing them to fight each other, and the Apostle Paul says, beware lest you be consumed by each other. In other words, be careful, you're going to destroy the church. And that just helps us to see how important this topic is. License, using our Christian liberty uh, as an excuse for sin, has the danger of destroying the church. That is what verse 15 is saying. The Apostle Paul is warning them about that. And that was a danger they faced in the first century. It's a danger we face in the 21st century. Using your Christian liberty as license can destroy not only your own Christian walk, but it can destroy the Christians around you. And so the Apostle Paul is addressing this topic, and it's something that, that we need to, 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 to learn about. It's a very important teaching uh, in the Bible. And so if we ask the Apostle Paul, how, how can we avoid legalism and, on the other hand, avoid license? Well, the answer that he gives is walk in the Spirit. That's how you can avoid legalism on one end and license on the other. Walk in the Spirit. And you'll see on the, on the screen there, the, the, that's how we're going to look at the, the passage this evening. That, that, that's how it's set out. First, you've got the command to walk in the Spirit in verse 16. And then the Apostle Paul gives three reasons why the Christians are to walk in the Spirit. They're to walk in the Spirit because the inner conflict is real. They're to walk in the Spirit because the sinful nature destroys. They're to walk in the Spirit because the Spirit brings life. And then at the end, the Apostle Paul repeats the command to, to walk in the Spirit or to keep in step with the Spirit. So that's the outline of the passage, and that's how we're going to look at it this evening. So the Apostle Paul has a command, walk in the Spirit, and then he, he tells us why we are to do that, why they were to do it then and why we are to do it now. So let's look at it firstly then. The Apostle Paul begins in verse 16 with a command, and this is what he says. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, or it says in the NIV 84, live in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So in verse 16, the Apostle Paul begins with a command. There's a command, and then we see the result that will follow if you obey the command. And what is the command? Well, he says, walk in the Spirit. Remember, the context is, how can I avoid license uh, as I'm avoiding legalism? He says, well, the way to do it is to walk in the Spirit. Now, what does the Apostle Paul mean by walk in the Spirit? In the NIV, in the, in the 1984 translation, it says, live in the Spirit. So, so what does it mean? Well, it means to live a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, we must notice this is a command and not a suggestion. It's not a, 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 a kind of take it or leave it scenario. This is a command, something you must do. And it means to let the Holy Spirit control us. It means to let the Holy Spirit guide us in every area of our lives. Now, the Holy Spirit guides us, we could say, externally and internally. He guides us from outside of us and inside of us. He guides us outside of us by the Word of God. This is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit guides us through the Word of God. But then the Christian, the believer, also has the inward uh, guiding of the Holy Spirit. When you became a Christian, you were born again. You were regenerated. God gave you His Spirit. He gave you a new nature. And now God's Spirit dwells in you. And we are to be obedient to Him and to obey His direction, His guiding, His influencing, His leading, His empowering, His convicting. All of these different things that the Holy Spirit does. Now, to walk in the Spirit doesn't just mean that we, 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 we lay back, as some people say, uh, 
let go and let God. We're not quietists. We're not uh, Quakers. You know, it's not just passive, but it's also active. It means to depend upon the Holy Spirit for guidance, but also to act upon the guidance that he gives. We, we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit when I do something wrong, and I stop doing it. We have the dependence upon him, and then we have the action that, 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 we, that we, act, we act in the strength that he gives. We have submission. We submit to what he wants, to what he, 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 he guides us to do through his word and through the inward working in our hearts. We submit to him. We submit to his power. We rely on him. And we obey him. It's active and it's passive. We submit and we obey. We depend upon him for strength, for leading, for guidance. And then we act in the strength that he gives. And our entire life is to be controlled in this way. The Apostle Paul says, walk in the Spirit. And that means to live every moment of your life in total dependence on him and, and allowing him to, to control you. Now, this, this uh, two-sided coin of dependence and action is described in another way in Philippians 2. It's what you might call an antinomy. How, 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 how can I both uh, depend upon him, submit to him, and obey him? How can he work in me, and at the same time, I have to work as well? Well, in Philippians 2, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We're to act, we're to obey, we're to work out our own salvation in obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we're to depend upon him to will and to do for the desire and the ability for God's good pleasure. So to walk in the Spirit, it means that when he convicts me of something that I'm doing wrong, I obey him and I stop doing it. We depend upon him, we submit to him, and then we act in obedience. And the, the, the way the Apostle Paul says this in this, in, this, in, this, in this section is in four different ways. He uses four different verbs to, to capture the whole meaning of what he's saying. He says, walk in the Spirit. He says that we're led by the Spirit. There you've got the active and the passive. He says we live in the Spirit or by the Spirit. And then finally, we keep in step with the Spirit. And all of these different verbs, we're going to go through and look at them in, as we go through. But they help us to see what the Apostle Paul means by this. And we need to note as well, to walk in the Spirit, it is, it, it, in, the, in the Greek there, it, it, it is a present verb. Now, I don't think we need to always talk about what's in the Greek, but this is helpful because... It tells us that, it, that this is continuous action. This is something we're to keep doing. If, if, if you could read, read Greek in the New Testament, if you, if you were in the first century and, uh, and you were reading it in, in Greek, you would see that. It, it's continuous action. It means to keep doing it. It's not a, a, a one-off suggestion. It's not, well, I walked in the Spirit yesterday, so now I've done it. But it's keep walking in the Spirit. Keep doing it. Walk in the Spirit and don't stop walking in the Spirit. Live a Spirit-controlled life. And what will happen if you do that? We submit to Him and then we obey Him. What would happen? Well, we see the result in the end of verse 16. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says, if you do this, if you walk in the Spirit, then this is the good news. You will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature. Now, we're going to, going to look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment. But when you became a Christian, you, you received a new nature, you were born again, but the old man is still there. The old man is still alive, if you like. Well, he should be crucified, we're going to get to that, but he still exists. In every Christian, there's this, there's this battle going on of, of the old man, the old unregenerate side of you, and the new man. The, which, through whom the Holy Spirit works. And there's this battle. And here the Apostle Paul is saying, if you walk in the Spirit, if you allow the Holy Spirit to control you, and if you obey Him in every area, every moment of your life, well then the desires of the old man, which is still there, you will not fulfill his desires. When he says to you, oh, go on, 
turn over the channel, just have a little look. Well, if you're walking in the Spirit, you can say no, no. And what's encouraging here is that in the original there, that it is very emphatic. He's basically, it's, he's saying you will by no means fulfill the lust of the flesh. In, in, in the Greek there, he's, he, he's saying it in, in, in the strongest way possible. If you really wanted to, to show that something wasn't going to happen, you used a double negative. Now, in English, it doesn't work. A double negative means a positive. Um, but but in, in the Greek, a double negative means it's just impossible. It's not going to happen by no means. And so what the Apostle Paul here is saying, he says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will by no means fulfill the lust of the flesh. For as long as you are obeying Him and allowing Him to control you, you will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature. Now here is a command for us to keep. A command for us to keep, to keep, to keep obeying. And the challenge is, are, are you doing this? Can it be said about you that you are walking in the Spirit? And as I said at the start, this is something we need to keep being reminded of. It's something I need to keep being reminded of. As I was thinking about preaching this evening, I thought I, I should mention, as I stand here, I'm preaching to myself. I'm, I, I, I need to hear this. When I say, are you doing this? It says, oh, I'm looking in the mirror and saying it to myself. This is something we must do as Christians. If we want to win the battle against the sinful nature, the old man who likes to rise his head at every convenient moment, if we want to win that battle, we need to walk in the Spirit. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to control us. We need to listen to Him. We need to obey Him every moment of our lives. We need to depend upon Him for help, for strength. We can't do it in our own strength. We have to depend upon Him and the, the grace that He gives. But in depending, we have to act. We have to obey and here, there is real and practical hope for the Christian, isn't there? The, the, the Christian life, yes, there is the old man, and we see it in Romans 7. We're going to get to that in a minute of the conflict in the Christian. The, the old man is still there, but it doesn't have to be a life of constant defeat. Yes, there is the battle, but it can be a victorious battle. It can be a battle that you can be winning. The Apostle Paul here says, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, God says here, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature. Maybe you're battling with things at the minute and you're thinking, I just can't do it. The Apostle Paul says, if you walk in the Spirit, then you can. You can. And it's a lie of the devil to say that you can't. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And now the Apostle Paul goes on and he explains why. Why is this true? And he gives us three reasons. It's true because... The inner conflict is real. We need to walk in the Spirit because there's that inner conflict. We need to walk in the Spirit because the sinful nature destroys. And we need to walk in the Spirit because the Spirit brings life. So firstly then, the first reason why you need to walk in the Spirit is because the inner conflict is real and it is unrelenting. It never ends. Now, we see in this passage that, that we're reminded, as we are throughout Scripture, that there, is, there are two forces at work within a Christian. And that is the force of the sinful nature, if you like, the flesh or the old man, who is weakened. He, he's received a death blow, if you like, but he's not quite dead yet. And he can still be a powerful foe. And then you've got the new man, the regenerate nature, through whom the Holy Spirit works. And these two forces exist within the one Christian. And we see it in Romans 7, don't we? And in Romans 8. In Romans 7, you've got the Apostle Paul who is saying, the things that I want to do, I, I, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, these are the things that I do. And at the end, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But then you have Romans 8. If, if all you had was Romans 7, it would be so depressing. But then, he goes, then you've got Romans 8. And Romans 8 says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And Romans 8 speaks about the, the victory you can have as you walk in the Spirit. Yes, there is the old man still there. He still likes to raise his head every so often. But if you walk in the Spirit. And so there are these two forces that, that, that exist within the, within the believer. And here the Apostle Paul reminds us in verse 17 that they are battling with each other. And they're battling, if you like, for control of you. It says in verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. 
And here we learn that inside every believer there's a battle, there's a war going on, and it's more fierce than the war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a war for your soul, if you like. And, and, and the old man doesn't want to give up. He doesn't like that he's been knocked off the throne. So he's trying to, to force his way back in. And the new nature, through, through, through the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit working in you, is, is fighting against the old nature. And here we learn that they're against each other. And there's this battle going on. And this is why you need to walk in the Spirit. This is why you can't let your guard down. Because there is this war going on inside you. The old man, the old person, the old nature, the sinful nature, wrestling against the Spirit of God, the, the new nature. And so you can't let your guard down. The Apostle Paul says, walk in the Spirit because the inner conflict is real. Now, as we grow as Christians, this conflict should, we, we, we should be, I'm not going to say it gets easier because older, older Christians will say to me, that's not true. And I don't want to say that. Say that. But, but the, the process of sanctification is where we, we day by day, we, we obey more and more the Spirit and we, 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 we neglect, we, we put to death more and more the old man. We die more and more to sin and we live more and more to God. That should be what's happening. Sometimes it's by increments and slow steps, but as we grow as Christians, the battle uh, should be going in the right direction. And that's what the process of sanctification ultimately is. But it's not until we're glorified. It's not until we see him and we will be like him because we will see him as he is when we're changed and made like Jesus. It's not until then that this battle finishes. And so until then, we need to walk in the spirit because the inner conflict is real and it is unrelenting. And then in verse 18, it says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Yes, there's this inner conflict, the flesh and the Spirit at war against each other. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And there we see, led by the Spirit, you've got the, the passive side of it. He leads us. He guides us. And so we, we, we walk as He leads. And what, what is true about the Spirit-led person? Well, they're not under the law. We're not under the law's condemnation. And we're not under the law. We're not trying to be made right with God by the works of the law. That's what he says. So, do you see this conflict in yourself? That's a, a good question as we apply this, this uh, point here. Do you see this conflict in yourself? If you do see this conflict in yourself, if you say, yes, I feel this battle in me every day, then although it might be discouraging, it should actually encourage you because it shows you that God has done a work of grace in your heart. If you don't have this battle, if you sin and it doesn't bother you, then you need to be very worried. If this battle isn't going on within you between the flesh and the spirit, if it's not happening, then you need to ask yourself, am I born again? Am I really a Christian? But if this battle is happening in you, well, you should be encouraged because it shows you that God has done a work of grace in your life. The fact that the flesh is worn against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh shows you that you have been born again. You are regenerate. Now the question is, what what are we doing about it? Are we strengthening the new nature? Are we helping the Spirit of God, if you like? Or are we strengthening the old nature? Are we giving ammunition to the bad guy? I think there was, uh, this is just an, an, an illustration off the top of my head, so if it's not correct, don't hang too much weight on it. But uh, uh, when Obama was president with ISIS, at one point, I think they, 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 they managed to lose a load of weapons. And ISIS got hold of all of these uh, American weapons. Now, it was an accident, I believe. But are we doing that? Are we giving weapons to the bad guy, strengthening the old man? Or are we, or are we weakening him day by day? Well, if we walk in the Spirit, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be weakening the old man. We don't give him a, a, an inch. We don't give him... Uh, any foothold. It says in Romans 13 verse 14, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. How do you make provision for the flesh? Well, you put yourself in situations where you're easily tempted. You've got a weakness with drink and you buy a bottle of wine 
and you, you open it when you're on your own. Well, you're just, you're just opening yourself up to temptation. You've, you're making provision for the flesh. How do you not do that? Well, you don't put yourself, you don't put yourself in, 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 in a situation where you can be tempted. Or perhaps you struggle with lust. You don't watch films that, are, that, 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 that have got images in it that might lead from one thing to another. You don't make provision for the flesh. Rather, you strengthen the spirit. You pray. You fast. You repent. You read the word of God. You have fellowship with other believers. You uh, tell others about Christ. You strengthen the new man. You, you, you walk in the spirit. And by doing that, day by day, little by little, you weaken the old man. So we're to walk in the spirit because the inner conflict is real and it is unrelenting. You also walk in the spirit, you need to, because the sinful nature destroys. The sinful nature, if you give him uh, full control, he will destroy you. This is what we see in verse 19 to 21. The sinful nature will destroy you. Here the Apostle Paul lists the works of the flesh. And then he tells us what happens when a person practices these things. Now, we don't have time to go through all the works of the flesh, and I'm quite happy about that because it's quite depressing to go through it. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do your soul any good. But we, we, we could define it as John Stott says that, that, that we can put them into groups there to do with sex, God, society, and drink. The first lot are to do with sexual immorality, fornication, adultery, uncleanness, lewdness. The other, the second lot are to do with how we relate to God, idolatry, sorcery, or witchcraft. And then the next bunch are to do with society, how we deal with other people. And these are contentions, hatred, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders. And then the final lot is to do with alcohol and uh, even gluttony even. Drunkenness, revelries, and he says, and the like. And what he's saying, all these things are the works of the flesh. These are the things that you will do if you allow the sinful nature to have control of your will, to control you. If you obey him, then this, these are the things that you will be doing. And it says at the end there, and the like. Or in some translations it says, such things like these. It's not an exhaustive list. But the point is, if you allow the, the, the flesh, the old man, to control you, these are the things that you will do. Now, these are the things that the, 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 the non-Christian does. Now, not all of it. I'm not saying every, every non-Christian is a murderer. But these are things that, 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 that we that I did before I was a, a Christian because the old nature was all I had. I was dead in sin and shapen in iniquity. And in one form or another, this describes the, 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 the lives and the lifestyles and the practices and the behavior of non-Christians. It's the old man. But if you're a Christian, you should have a new nature. You should have the new man. And so these things shouldn't be true about you. But if you allow the flesh to have control... You will do these things. And why is it so serious? Why is it such a big deal? Well, look at the consequence in verse, at the end of verse 21. It says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What the Apostle Paul here is saying, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, he's saying if you live like this in unrepentance, if you practice these things on this list, you might not have murdered, but if you have envy or, or if you have hatred and, and, and these things uh, d define the way you live, if you practice these things, he says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we could say, you will go to hell. That's really what he's saying here. You won't be with God in his kingdom. You'll be in hell. He says, those who practice these things. Now, we must understand that there's a word there which means practice. In the NIV, I think it translates it as if you live in these things. The idea isn't that if you just slip up, say, for example, you, 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 you allow the flesh to have a, his way for a moment, if you like, and you envy somebody. Well, that doesn't mean, oh, I've, I've envied someone. Now I've lost my salvation. 
but he's speaking about somebody who practices these things. Now, I would say if a person is a Christian, then they won't be practicing these things. That's the point. But if you are practicing these things, you have to ask yourself, am I a Christian? If you're living, doing these things in, in the lust of the flesh without repentance, I'm not speaking about an occasional slip up, but without repentance, this is what you practice. This is your life. This is a continuous behavior of yours. You have to ask yourself the, the question, am I born again? And what does, what does the Apostle Paul say about such people? He says that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, maybe you're here this evening and you're saying to yourself, well, that's me ruined then. I'm screwed because this is me. I do these things, some of them. I, I, drunkenness is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a part of my life every weekend. Or, or, or fornication. The word fornication means sexual immorality. The Greek word is pornea which we get pornography from, and it's all sexual immorality. Maybe you say, that's me. I'm bound by it. So there's no hope for me then. I can't see the kingdom of God. I'm going to hell. Well, the message of the Bible is Jesus Christ came to save such people. Now, if you practice these things and you don't repent, yes, you won't see the kingdom of God. But the message of the Bible is if you turn away from them, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven because he died on the cross for people like this. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, these words, it says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will, will inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying, if you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But look at what he says. He says, and such were some of you, past tense, such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Yes, if you practice these things and you don't repent, you will not see the kingdom of God. But there were people in the church of Corinth who used to do these things and they were saved by the grace of God when they believed in Jesus and they were washed. And you can be as well if you turn from your sin and trust in Christ. But as Christians, those of us who have already done that, we have been washed, we have been cleansed. And maybe you've done these things in the past, but now you've been saved and we can rejoice in that. But we must not miss the warning here because this is a warning that is written to, in a letter to Christians. And sometimes as Christians, when we know we're saved by grace, sometimes we can take refuge in that and we can think that if I sin, it's, it's no big deal. But let us not lose the force of the warning here. If, 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 if you claim to be a Christian, but you're living in these things unrepentantly, continuous behavior, this is you and you've, you don't stop it, then, then, then we, we can't take refuge. He says here that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if your life is practicing these things, it's your lifestyle, you don't stop it, you keep doing it. You can't take refuge in Christ. You, you have to repent. We can't say I'm saved by grace so I can keep on sinning, so I can keep on hating. We can't take refuge. The word of God here says if you practice these things, you will not see the kingdom of God. It's not saying if you slip up as a Christian and then you repent. Yes, the Bible says if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. That's the wonderful truth of, of the gospel. But this is speaking about people who who don't repent, and if, and if you say you're a Christian and you don't repent, this, this verse here takes away all assurance, and I encourage you to turn from your sin and to trust Christ for mercy and forgiveness. The Christian life is one of repentance. Yes, we slip up, but this isn't speaking about slip-ups. It's speaking about an unrepentant person. So the Apostle Paul says, walk in the Spirit because the inner conflict is relentless. It is real. Walk in the Spirit because the sinful nature will destroy you. Thirdly, he says, walk in the Spirit because the Spirit brings life. And I don't know how I've managed this, but it's five past seven, and I've not even got to the best bit yet. So you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to have to really rush through this. The Spirit brings life. This is why you need to walk in the Spirit, because the Spirit brings life. The flesh will destroy you, but the Spirit brings life. And here we see the fruit of the Spirit. Nine Christian graces. And, and, and as you read through it, it's just, they're, they're just wonderful. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
If you allow the Spirit to work in you, these are the fruits that you'll produce. These are the things that will be true about you. These graces will be in your life. These will, dis- these will be what you are like. You will have love, love for God, love for other people. You will have joy in your heart, a joy because you know God, a joy that doesn't disappear even when bad news comes. You will have peace. Because you've got peace with God, you will have the peace of God in your heart. Peace in tribulation, peace when everything is crumbling around you, you'll have the peace of God in your heart. Kindness, you'll be a kind person. Goodness, kindness in action, you'll be good to people. People will know it. They'll want to be around you because of of your goodness, because of your kindness. They'll want to be in your presence because of how you are. Faithfulness, you'll be reliable and trustworthy. People will, will, will believe what you say. People will depend upon you because you have faithfulness, gentleness. You won't uh, have an outburst of, of rage, but you'll be gentle or, or meek is another way you could translate that. Self-control. You'll be, you'll be able to have self-control over, over what you eat and what you drink and what you say. And we could really defi- uh, sum all of this up in the phrase Christ-likeness. You will be like Jesus. If you walk in the Spirit and you allow Him to work in your life and you depend upon Him, you obey Him, then these are the fruits that you will produce. You will be like Christ. And it says there in verse uh, 24, 23 even, at the end of 23, it says, against such there is no law. And that's an understatement. He's basically saying nobody can, can condemn you. If, you, if you've got these things, no one can condemn you. No one will say that's bad. There's no law against these things because these things are good. These things are right. And if you walk in the Spirit and allow Him to control you, these will be true about you. These will, will flow out of you. God will work these in you. Now, when, when people look at us, the challenge is, do they see these, these graces in us? I was thinking earlier on as I was thinking about this, this is always a difficult sermon to preach when your wife's in the congregation because it's often the people you're nearest to that see actually you don't always have these fruits in in, in your life, but they should be there, maybe not in as much as we would like them to be, but nevertheless they, they should be there and as we grow in sanctification, as we grow as Christians, they should be there more and more and more. Do our spouses see these graces in us, these fruits of the Spirit? Maybe you're here this evening and you're not a Christian and you think, I would like for those things to be true about me. I would like to be a loving person. I would like to have joy and gentleness. I want those things. How can I have those things? Just imagine how your relationships would change if, if, if these things were true about you. Maybe you, you've got a really uh, good ability of, of messing up friendships. But if you had these things in your life, in your heart, how different it would be. Well, the only way to have these, these things, these fruits of the Spirit, is to be born again. No Christian can, can, can stir these up themselves. It's the work of God in the heart of a person. And if you want these fruits of the Spirit yourself, you need to be born again. You need to be regenerated. You need God's Spirit to change you. You need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's Spirit will work these things in you. So the Apostle Paul says, walk in the Spirit because the inner conflict is real and it's unrelenting. Walk in the Spirit because the sinful nature will destroy you. Walk in the Spirit because the Spirit gives life. And finally, he, he, he bookends it. He finishes it off with another command. And he says, walk in the Spirit. He's, he's, he, he's bookended this whole section with two commands. Well, it's the same command. He's repeated it. Walk in the Spirit. And then he finishes it off again by saying, walk in the Spirit. In verse 24, he says, if you are a Christian, then the flesh, the old man, the sinful nature, should have been crucified. He says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now notice that is active. That's not saying that's that's something that's been done to you or for you. He's saying those who are Christians have done this. Now there is a sense in which when, when we were saved and born again, this was done to us. We were crucified with Christ. But here, it is done by us. And it's speaking about us putting off the old man. It's what used to be called mortification. 
which means putting to death. And we put to death the old man, the old habits, the old desires. We put them to death. We stop doing them. We repent. We put off the old man. We, as if it, says, it says if you are a Christian, those who are Christ, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now that doesn't mean that he is completely dead. We've given him the death blow when we were converted, but he's dying a slow death. And it's like a, a uh, I imagine if you were fighting with a dinosaur and you, you, you gave it a blow on the head, well, you've still got to watch out for the tail because you've given him the death blow. But if, if in his, as he's uh, struggling, if he hits you with his tail, uh, you, 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 it's going to be bad news. Now, I could have thought of a different illustration, but the, the dinosaur was what came to my head first. The whole point is the old man, is, we've given him the death blow, but he's still a dangerous enemy as he's dying. Yes, he's been crucified. and We, we have but he's still there, so we need to walk in the Spirit. And it says in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It says, if you have been born again, if the Spirit is in you, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, this word is slightly different to the one that was at the beginning in verse 16. This word, it really means keep in step with the Spirit. And the, the NIV translates it that way. Keep in step with the Spirit. It's a military term. It means keep in line with the Spirit. Follow Him. Keep in sync with Him. Be under his discipleship and his control. And again, it's a continuous command. It's a, it's a present imperative. Keep doing it, he's saying. Keep in step with the Spirit. And then he finishes off. He says, he says walk in the Spirit. He says, let us, uh, let us also walk in the Spirit. Verse 26, he then says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. He finishes off by saying, walk in the Spirit and don't fall out with each other. We could say that if you fall out with each other, it's because you've fallen out of line with the Holy Spirit. He says, keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in line with the Spirit. Follow Him. And then you won't be uh, disunited. You won't be falling out with each other. So how can the Christian avoid legalism on one hand and the, 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 the danger of license on the other? How can we uh, be holy without being legalistic and without using our liberty to sin? Well, the answer is to walk in the Spirit. Allow Him to control you. Depend upon Him and obey Him. Walk in the Spirit because the inner conflict is real. Walk in the Spirit because the sinful nature will destroy you. Walk in the Spirit because the Spirit brings life. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, walk in the Spirit. Well, I'm just going to pray and then uh, Tim will, will announce our, our last song. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work of your spirit in our lives. And Father, we confess that as we look at your word, we, 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 we realize we're not what we ought to be. We're not what we want to be. And we thank you, Father, that we're not what we will be. Father, we thank you for the blessed hope of our glorification that one day we will be perfect. If Jesus is our Savior, one day we will be totally set free from sin in a place where there is no sin. But Father, we, 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 we know that's not where we are yet. And Father, we pray that you will help us to grow in our sanctification, that we will be more and more like Jesus every day. And Father, we know that in order to do that, we must walk in the Spirit. Father, help us to do that every single day. Remind us of the need to do it, Father, that we might honor you and glorify you. Father, forgive us for the times when we have given leeway to the flesh. Forgive us, Father, we pray. And we pray that you might produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life in a, in, in a greater way than, than, than we've ever, ever experienced. Father, give us help, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.